You're forewarned. Posterity will know exactly what you say. All right, good evening, everyone. Let's uh, begin by taking our prayer. And uh, we, I think, have uh, uh, David Buck. You are, this is your first time with us? Yes, it is. Welcome. How did you find out about our group? Uh, I can't, is my mute off? No, it's off. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Uh, I know a guy named Seth Pollock who I've been hanging out with for quite a while. Um, ah, the so, Monterey Connection. Right, the Monterey Connection. So I, I, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. If you're connected with Seth, then forget it. You can't, <laughs> you can't be, he, told, he told me you'd say that. Right. He did. He, yeah, well, he knows me. He knows me he too well. Me. He, me. Yeah. he knows me too well. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so, so you're out there also. I'm on the left coast. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Welcome. Thank um, you. So, uh, um, if you want to get a copy of the prayer that we start with, send me please an email, and I'll send it to you. Not now, uh, but next yeah. time. My email is dgreenstein. That's one word at mm -hmm. shomrei.org. S h o m r e i dot org. Oh, Seth is here now. Look at that. Oh. Okay. Good. So welcome. All right. So we'll begin. We'll begin the prayer together. Master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion. You know what? We tried last week. We did this with everybody muted, um, and I appreciate the, that somebody decided that this would be a good way to do it. But you know what? It. I would. I think even though it it gets to be a little chaotic, for this part of it, let's unmute. And if you have the prayer, let's all join together. Okay, so you start again. What are we? Let our faults and may it be your desire to feel more May you open our hearts to the beautiful heart May this be a source of May their merit and for us the words of my heart the mouth of my heart acceptable to you my rock and my redeemer for it is from his Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
page 261 in the uh, second uh, volume of Danny Matt's translation of the Zohar. So we're on page 136a of uh, the first uh, uh, volume of the Zohar and it's three sections traditionally uh, the way it's divided up. Um, we're in Parashat Toldot, uh, which is the uh, one Torah portion that is devoted in one way or another to discussing the life of the second patriarch, Isaac. And uh, the uh, um, section that we're in right now is uh, part of a uh, discussion between two of the disciples of Rashbi, two of Abishun Bar Yochai's uh, students and uh, followers. And it's a story about Rabbi Yitzchak, um, who uh, is um, joined by surprise uh, by his fellow uh, Rabbi Yehuda. And we had this very beautiful kind of beginning of the of the story where Rabbi Yitzchak gets up in the middle of the night, is studying all by himself, and he's studying out loud. And Rabbi Yehuda decides to, uh, at the spur of the moment, go and visit his colleague because he knows he's close by. So he he comes to the door and he overhears Rabbi Yitzchak studying all by himself. And he's studying 
uh, this uh, beginning story of the the uh, transition from Abraham's uh, death to Yitzchak uh, becoming the the uh, the heir of uh, of uh, Abraham and the issue of the blessing. So we had that whole discussion already that it is God who blesses Isaac rather than Abraham. And the verse uh, in, uh, concludes by, by telling us that Yitzchak dwelled uh, in Be'er Lachai Ro'i, uh, along with, uh, uh, by the side of the, uh, of the well called Lachai Ro'i. So what does this mean? Um, and uh, Rabbi uh, Yitzchak, whose name is Yitzchak, as Isaac, uh, explains to himself uh, that uh, this uh, means that Yitzchak merited the blessing from God because of Yitzchak's own efforts to bond with uh, Shekhinah. So uh, I'm going to ask whoever it is uh, that's not uh, muted to mute until such time as you want to read or you want to uh, make a discussion so that we don't get any uh, extra noises going on. So that's when Rabbi Yehuda knocks on the door and uh, the bonding that uh, is discussed as a kind of just a biblical and uh, spiritual reality uh, with the, the ancient patriarch all of a sudden becomes real in the moment. The bonding is between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yitzchak. They bond together and then together they bond with Shechina. So that's where we we're, we're talking at the end about the 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 uh, um, threesome that uh, now is 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 uh, established between these two loving um, comrades and Shechina. They're all going to study Torah together. And uh, Rabbi Huda begins by agreeing with what Rabbi Yitzchak said about the understanding about uh, uh, Isaac bonding with Shechina. And then he unpacks that, that set of, of words, the, the last phrase of that verse, and he explains that this is also a kind of a three-way uh, uh, conjunction. It's Isaac with Shechina and with the intermediary uh, um, uh, righteous uh, one, vitality of the word of the world. So in terms of uh, uh, the symbolism of the Zohar, these are different aspects of, of God's being and of God's um, activity, manifestation. And we, we know that um, the, uh, um, the, uh, in, the, the exemplification of Gvura is Isaac. And uh, the uh, Shechina is God's beloved in the in the feminine uh, aspect, and the righteous one is the uh, the phallic uh, member of God, the male point of contact with uh, with Shechina, with his beloved. So they are all joining together. And Yitzchak becomes not just a human being, the patriarch who is spiritually questing to unite with God, but in his being uh, the exemplification of Gvura, he's also uh, illustrating a dynamic within, within God. Right? And the dynamic is that this uh, aspect of, of judgment of constraint, of uh, of limitation, of uh, in, of uh, encapsulation, which is Isaac, um, and which is also part of God, is through is pouring through the uh, channel, which is the righteous one, and joining with Shechina, um, eventually. Um, that is both a dynamic within God of unification. All aspects of God come together. But it also means that as a result, Shekhinah is vitalized in a particular way 
to uh, uh, pour forth God's uh, um, life-giving uh, energy into the world itself with a particular way of mixing gvura with chesed. Uh, love, unbounded love, with the binding quality of Isaac. So, and this is um, by means the intermediary or the 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 joiner, the, the 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 agent that makes this union possible, is the righteous one. And the last words that we read last time, I think, are at the end of that first paragraph on two sixty one. That he, meaning the righteous one, the tzaddik, or uh, also known as Yisod, the foundation, lives in two worlds: of upper, the above upper world and the lower world, enduring, glowing through him. Right? So this is uh, the, uh, the uh, channeling of all of God's light, um, filled up, is, is, is filling up with that light, and then, of course, pouring it forth into Shechina. So now we're up to come and see. So uh, um, I'd like to ask somebody to read it for us. So you'll have to, somebody has to volunteer and unmute and read it out loud for, for everybody, please. Who's going to do that tonight? All right, I'll do it. Since no all right, all right. So which come and see, the first one or the second first one? one? The first one. First one. Come and see. The moon is illumined only when seeing the sun. Upon seeing him, she shines. So this, well, the Chairo E, sees the living one precisely and is then illumined, sustained by living waters. Lachai Ro'i, seeing the living one, to be filled and illumined by this living one. Okay, so the the, the phrase is now uh, understood, the be'er, the well of seeing the living one. So as before it says that the... Uh, um, that aspect of God is called Chei Ha'olamim, the life of the worlds, the vitality of the worlds. Um, so that's the Chai. And La Chai Ro'i, toward the living one, looking and seeing. That's the way the, the Zohar uh, unpacks that phrase. And she is the Be'er. She is the well who looks toward um, the, uh, uh, the living one. And the uh, example, the analogy is made between the moon and the sun. Right? The sun pours forth its light. The sun is full of vitality, full of life and light. And the moon is a receptor, right? It takes the light of the sun. And then it reflects the light. But it doesn't generate light on its own. The Shemesh, the, the, the sun, is constantly creating more light, generating more light. The moon is illumined only when seeing the sun. So here's the seeing part, the Ro'i. Right? It's not automatic. It doesn't happen just by itself, according to the way the Zohar understands it. There needs to be a, a turning uh, by the, the moon toward the sun. Right? That's the, that's the, the, the way that the that the Zohar imagines this. Um, when the moon turns toward the sun, then the moon becomes lit up. But if the moon would turn away from the sun, then uh, the moon would be in darkness. The light of the sun would not reach uh, the moon. And this is done not simply by orientation, but it's by done. It's done by looking. It's done by by seeking the word here for looking roe um signifies not just i happen to see it but i'm looking for it i'm i'm yearning for it i'm i'm uh, wishing for it uh profoundly so if the moon turns toward the sun um with that sense of desire with that sense of will with that sense of uh of uh of yearning, then it is able to be filled up by God's life, 
by the sun's light. Um, so when the well sees the living one, precisely, right, the lachai, and is then illumined, uh, sustained by the, the living waters. It is filled and illumined by the living one. So where does the, 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 the filling up come from? Right. Where does where does this um, life giving force uh, come from? It comes from the sun, or it comes from the tzaddik, right? It comes from the living one, but it won't go into, it won't penetrate the moon, or the lover, or shechina, or the human being who desires, unless the, the human being looks into the light, right? That's the only way that this happens. It doesn't happen, you're not, you know, if we're not, I mean, we obviously would, you know, the light is shed upon us whether we look at it or not, but we don't get filled with light. We ourselves don't incorporate the light, says the Zohar, unless we actually let our eyes turn toward the source of light and then we need to imagine, I, I think, that the light then pours into our eyes. So this is a kind of a, a, a you know a, an, an ancient uh, uh, idea of, of seeing and of and of uh, optics. We we uh, you know obviously when when we look at things, that's part of what's happening, right? The light enters into our into the pupil of our eye, and then it gets in, and 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 whatever happens happens. I really have, have no knowledge of, of the science of this in, in any kind of secure way. I would remark, though, that in ancient times there was another theory where seeing was actually projection, where seeing was actually that we sent out, um, you know, uh, optical feelers, so to speak. The same way that that we touch by by putting our fingers out and and uh, uh, stretching them out and 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 putting them in contact with something, there was an ancient idea that when we see things, it's actually we actively send out these seeing rays, so to speak, that then grab hold of an object, and then uh, that's how we get to see the object. So here, what the Zohar is saying is. The active part is not these rays that come out of us. We have no rays. We are the moon. We are not generating these rays. But what we do generate is desire. What we do generate is the, um, the wish to be filled up with light. Um, we, uh, um, we have a blessing that uh, we recite traditionally uh, before we go to bed at night. It's part of the ritual of saying the Shema um, uh, on, 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 our, on our bed when we go to sleep. And it's called the Hamapil, the Hamapil blessing. And Hamapil means the one who brings down. Um, we praise God, Hamapil Chevlei Sheina Alenai, who brings down these aspects, these portions of sleep upon my eyes, and drowsiness on my eyelids. And then there's a prayer that my sleep should be peaceful, that I shouldn't have nightmares, that uh, it should be a, a restorative sleep. I don't want to go into all the details. And then it says, pen ishan So and it illumine my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Right. So, so the the illuminating of the eyes in this blessing is: May I be able to wake up in the morning and be able to uh, look around and appreciate uh, the new the new light of a new day. Because you are the one who illuminates the pupil inside the eye. 
so the pupil, of course, is the black, the black part of the eye. And we have this idea that you are the one, even though there's darkness in my eye, it looks dark, but that's actually the part that's going to be seeing, that's going to be filled with light. So you are the one who illuminates that dark spot in the middle of my eye. Um, the ishon is punned with the word ishan, lest I die, lest I sleep, the sleep of death. You are the one who illuminates my, the pupil of my eye, my ishon. Um, and it's the, the light and the life are understood to be together. And then, Baruch Hashem, you abound in blessings, eternal one. Hameir la'olam kulo, b'chvodo. By means of your glory, you light up the whole world. So the, uh, um, and this is said when? In the middle of the night, in the darkness. So your glory doesn't exist only in the sunlight, although that could be a very glorious experience to, to, to feel that sunlight uh, shining forth. But of course, your glory is illuminating the world all the time, even in the darkness. So the illumination is a, an infusion of life, an infusion of, of um, vitality and the infusion of, of, of uh, life itself. There's another part of our uh, prayers in the traditional services where we again talk about illuminating our eyes. We say, a lot of times we sing that song. So we the 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 blessing is the blessing right before the Shema. Another blessing that is tied to the recitation of the Shema. It's in the morning, uh, in the morning prayers and Shacharit, and we say, Let it be that our eyes be illuminated, lit up with your Torah. So how do we understand that? Um, if, we've, if we've sung that song before, what did we mean? Does anybody want to share what their own associations or, or thoughts have been when, when, we've, when we've said that prayer? Or what does it mean to you, you know, the phrase now off the top of our heads, illuminate my, illumine my eyes with your Torah. Enlighten my yeah, eyes I, I read it with as, your Torah. Who's speaking? I read it as enlightened. Len, yes, yeah, say it again. I, I read it as, you know, may, may you enlighten my eyes to partake in the wisdom of, of Torah. So, and, and light in English too. You, you uh, taking light and using that word. Okay, so, so, okay. so when, we, when we talk about the enlightenment, um, we talk about um, a kind of intellectual uh uh revolution we talk about a certain turn of consciousness um a, a kind of an, an awareness of things um but it's also very very intimately in the in the english language as well uh tied to seeing we see things differently we began to see the world differently when we were enlightened right um and of course one of the terms for the uh, Hevraya for these fellows, these associates, these comrades of Rashbi is Maskilim, the enlightened ones, the ones who know how to look at the world, the ones who know how to regard reality uh, without being uh, deflected by, by uh, um, false facts, fake news, false appearances, who really know how to see things. So yeah, enlightenment has a lot of that sense of, of uh, both of mind in an intellectual, dry kind of intellectual way, but also in a kind of a consciousness a, 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 um, way as well. But I want to uh, emphasize for the zillionth time, for the Zohar, there is always a deep connection between the literal and the metaphorical. So if enlightenment means Enlightenment it doesn't it also means enlightenment. It also means getting lit up. It actually really has to mean that too. 
and it's an impoverishment of our of our experience to skip over the literal and to skip over the simple for the sake of something which seems to be for us you know more mature or more uh, um, sophisticated enlighten my eyes or here in the in the blessing it really means put light into my eyes it really means that idea of of uh, illumination not the illuminati only although yes but also it means light it really means or we say that for his uh, traditionally when we wrap ourselves in a talit. And when we wrap ourselves in a talit, we should see nothing. Right? We take the talit, we put it over our heads, we wrap ourselves uh, uh, all around, and it's not a time when we're actually supposed to be seeing anything. We're not supposed to be looking around, we're supposed to be concentrating. On, on bringing ourselves under the, the protective shelter of God's wings. But the protective shelter of God's wings is Ote Orka Salma, Notesha Maim Kairia. God, when you created the world, you created a tissue, a fabric of light. It's all light. Let there be light. That's, the, that's what existence uh, uh, starts with. So at the same time that we actually close down, our, our uh, visual activity by just wrapping ourselves in the talit and and uh, collecting ourselves within that and giving ourselves a, just a hug, um, we're saying that this is actually the light that we are wrapping ourselves around with. It's not a light that's supposed to make us uh, you know disappear in the darkness. But it's a light that's that's the true light. This is God's glory. And that's the the light that lets us see. So yes, we end up taking the literal and we then again make it into symbolic and metaphorical uh, meaning. But it's always rooted in that paradox of the physical, the literal, um, that that then springs out into these other kinds of growths. Um, yeah, so here, by turning and by looking, which means opening up our eyes, that's part of our prayer that we recited at the very beginning this evening and every, every time we, we come together to, to study uh, Torah, we say that same thing again. I open my eyes so that I can be illumined and, and, and uh, vitalized by your Torah. Okay, so what happens here is that um, just as Rabbi Yehuda knocks on the door because he wants to be part of Rabbi Yitzchak's uh, uh, study of Torah, Rabbi Yitzchak doesn't seem to have that necessary desire. He's happy to be by himself. He's in uh, you know isolation. He's studying Torah. Him. And, and Torah are together, but Rabbi Yehuda wants to come in and join. And then Rabbi Yitzchak is very delighted. Same thing here. Shechina is looking up toward her lover, right? The moon is looking up to the sun. They want to be together. But then Yitzchak, Isaac, the second patriarch, is kind of knocking on the door. He wants to be part of this union as well. He wants to, to be in the, the mix also. Um, the image that comes up, I've mentioned it before. Um, when, a, when a couple is in bed together and then their kid, you know, comes in and goes, you know, move over. I want to be with you. Right. And, and the, uh, um, the love that is shared then between the three of them course is not the same love as the love that could be shared by the couple when they're all by themselves um, and uh, you know the 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 comedy or or other kinds of uh, um, emotional stuff that happens when the kid does that um, is part of of, uh, of you know human uh, uh, you know stories but 
you move over and you bring the kid in and there's something very very sweet about that there's something very very delicious about that kind of um, um, union um, and uh, I, I've heard that this actually can happen even when your kid is already in their 20s um, so uh, when 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 there's something that shakes them up enough um, that they that they that they want to be together they want to be together with the two lovers with the two the two exemplars of 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 love uh, for each other so this is isaac isaac is knocking on the door coming to live in be'er la chairoi coming to try to bond with shechina and with her uh, her lover to be part of that come and see Craig, back to you. Come and see. Binyahu, son ben of Yahu. Binayahu. Binayahu, son of Yehoyada, son of a living man, for he was righteous, illumining his generation as living one above illumines the world. This well constantly gazes upon the living one to be illumined, as we have said. Okay. So Binayahu. Is called Benayahu Ben Yehoyada Ben Ishchai, right? So there is again this uh, this uh, phrase of Chai. The the uh, uh, the description is that there's a person who was a, a really living person, all right? An Ishchai, and Benayahu was this person's son. So look at note twenty eight, please. Benayahu, son of Yehoyada son of a living man. Biniyahu was a loyal follower of King David. His righteous power parallels and symbolizes that of Yesod. Rabbi Chia said, the righteous are called living even in their death, as is said, Biniyahu, son of Yehoyada, son of a living man. Do you mean to say that all other people are sons of dead men? Rather, son of a living man, for even in his death, he was called living. Right. So his life force continued through into his son and from his son into his influence on David. So we should also just know on the side of this that David is an exemplification of Shekhinah. Right. So, so the, uh, um, the, the life force that is being uh, uh, applied um, and brought into David is brought from Benayahu. Benayahu literally means what? Son of God, right? Ben Yahu is the son of God, right? So, which all of us are, right? Ben, the, the son of Yehoyada, God intimately connected and knowing, right? So, apparently, Benayahu's father was someone closely uh, uh, united with God, and Benayahu is Ben Ishchai, is the true son of the living man, the man whose life continues through uh, after his death. How does this apply back to us? That's Yitzchak. Right? Yitzchak is the true son. Of Abraham and Abraham passes everything that is his as a blessing to his son despite the fact that as we just saw before there's no explicit act of blessing by Abraham to Isaac but it's confirmed rather by God okay. so this is the idea okay. all right Isaac dwelled Isaac dwelled by Be'er, the well, Lachai Ro'i, corresponding to what is written, Bekachto et Rivka, when he took Rebecca, dwelling with her, uniting with her, darkness with night, as is written, his left hand beneath my head. Okay. So what has happened here? We've now skipped to the end of the Torah portion that leads us 
into uh, um, in, we've skipped to the to the uh, um, the Torah portion that we're in, Toldot, and um, it tells us that um, Isaac was forty years old when he took uh, Rivka. So we skip the part about how old he was, and we just take the idea of Bekachto et Rivka when he took Rebecca, right? Dwelling with her, uniting with her, darkness with night. So this union, take a look at, at uh, note three, th uh, 30. Dwelling with her, darkness with night. Isaac's union with Rebekah enacts the union of Gvura, symbolized by Isaac and darkness, with Shechina, symbolized by Rebekah and night. Okay. So the union that we described before, how did Isaac merit the blessing? Why did God give Isaac the blessing? Um, and we're skipping the whole business about why Abraham didn't. Um, Isaac gains the blessing because God sees that Isaac wants to be part of this communion, part of this spiritual and, in, and spiritually erratic communion with God. And therefore God reciprocates and God blesses uh, Isaac to be uh, the, the heir of Abraham. So that seems to be completely on the spiritual level, Isaac's quest for God, his whole life is, is uh, involved in that. And now the punchline of this teaching is that it's not just some kind of disembodied spiritual uh, 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 journey that, that Isaac is on. It's not, in fact, a, 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 a denial of the body at all. It's not transcending the material to go to the spiritual. But actually, Isaac's passion for God is infused in Isaac's passion for Rebekah. He wants to take Rebekah. He loves Rebekah. We've talked about this many times. The first time in the Torah that we have, and one of the only times, that where we have a report of a man loving a woman. Right? This is Isaac is full of desire for Rebecca and says the Zohar, that's the same thing. Isaac's desire for Rebecca is inseparable from Isaac's desire for God, for Shechina, for Shechina uniting with her lover. In fact, that's how the Zohar, of course, has built this whole image up because the Zohar knows intimately um, what it means to be uh, desirous, to be uh, in love with another. And that earthly love, coming back to the idea of, of the literal, the material, the simple basic facts of life, literally, then become the grounding for metaphor, for spiritual uh, leaps and so on, but and then we have and then we say it back again, right? And then we label it as such. So Isaac's taking of Rebecca, which means his erotic sexual possession of his uh, of his wife, that union is precisely of the same quality um, and comes from the same place and goes to the same place as Isaac's desire for God. Uniting with her, dwelling with her. Um, then we have this phrase, which uh, uh, the note, uh, you know, features, and which we should, uh, you know, just pay attention to for a minute. Darkness with night. This goes back to that uh, discussion that, or the, the soliloquy that I gave before about, about light in the darkness, right? When we make those blessings at night or any other time, when we say, God, you fill, you, you fill the world with light through your glory. In the middle of the night, it's dark as, as, as hell out there, 
and yet the world is illumined the night is full of life and full of light from god's glory even though it's dark so the night is shina the night is not in and of itself darkness the night is the absence of the rays of the sun. Shechina is waiting for the sun to shine. Shechina is the moon waiting for the sun. So that's the night. What's the darkness? The darkness, anybody want to suggest something? Well, it says yeah. in the note, darkness is gvura. Yitzchak himself. Okay, so let's not use that kind of closed system terminology. Let's give it another word. What what's a what's a synonym or what's another uh, allied term for that? For gvura. Let's not let's make believe we don't know the word gvura. What does darkness then mean here? Constriction. Clo darkness. Well, closing in. Yeah, yeah. Darkness is the way we use the word dark as it's valenced in a negative way, right? When we, when we say, oh, that person, you know, dark forces are, uh, are you know, are uh, whatever, you know, surrounding us or attacking us. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've um, certainly in our world, dark has a scary and a, and a negative uh, association, right? The night can be romantic. The night can be, you know, full of, of whatever, but the night could be taken over by darkness or the opposite. What if darkness in all of its uh, scariness, in all of its uh, a sense of danger, what if it becomes enfolded in night as a gentle, easy, quiet, um, soothing, um, you know, uh, environment. Night is when we go to sleep. Right? Night can be a time of rest, a time of stopping from, from, from uh, being worried about things and having to run from this to that to the other thing, right? It's a time of replenishing one's energy, a time of replenishing one's own life forces. It's a time of lovemaking. So night and darkness are not necessarily the same. And Yitzchak is seeking something from the night. Yitzchak is reaching out. And that's that last uh, um, verse that comes from the song of songs, the love song of all love songs, right? Smolo tachat Roshi. That his left hand, the left hand is, is Yitzchak. The left hand is Gvura. The left side. The left side is reaching out, seeking that erotic, loving connection. It's the left side, but it wants something softer. It wants something... Uh, um, more giving. So Yitzchak, in all of his constriction, in all of his perhaps uptightness, in all of his passivity, he allows himself to be bound, bound up uh, by his father. In all of that sense of, of uh, uh, constriction and of... Um, non uh, uh non-giving he is giving in the sense of he's asking right he's asking for love he's asking for love and he gets it from rebecca he's he's transformed by rebecca who ever heard of uh the the dark side being full of love and yet that's what it is he's he falls in love with rebecca so the darkness unites with the nighttime.
okay, a couple more lines before we finish this little uh, uh, step in our in our story. Next page, two sixty two. Mm -hmm. Come and see. Another yeah. come and see. Yeah, come and see. After Abraham died, Isaac was in Kiryat Arba. So what is the meaning of Isaac dwelled by the well Lachai Roi, that he embraced and coupled with that well to arouse love, as we have said? Okay, so this is his final statement. And we have Rabbi Yehuda being very, very concerned to, to, to be able to read, navigate the text, to make sense of the text. When he first hears Rabbi Yitzchak's words, he goes, Rabbi Yitzchak, you're so right. Let me show you how it actually fits in the text. So now he does the same thing again. He says, what does it mean? Could, do we really have to take this absolutely straightforwardly that, that Yitzchak lived at Be'er Lachai Roi? No, we know that he lived in Hebron. So clearly the statement that he lived in Be'er Lachai Roi has to be taken in this new way of looking at it, the way both Rabbi Yitzchak and Rabbi Yehuda have described it. Um, and uh, we just mentioned it. We've got here, come and see, come and see. Come and see. This is a light motif in the Zohar. We've talked about it many times in the Aramaic. Tachazi. Tachazi. And this is something we all know by heart now. The difference between the Talmud and the Zohar. When uh, the Talmud wants to bring something to support an argument, to support a position, they say, Tashma, come and hear. When the Zohar wants to bring supporting evidence, or extra material to buttress, to further a statement or an argument, they say, Tachazi, come and see. Because it's about that Lachai Roi. It's about that seeing, turning with yearning toward the living source, toward the Chai. Come, come and see. Turn and look. Okay. All right, so now this Rabbi Yehuda um, has finished saying something, and now we go back to Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak now uh, responds. Rabbi Yitzchak opens, saying, The sun shines forth, and the sun sets, and pants toward where he rises. The sun shines forth, sun illumining moon, for when appearing with her, he glows, illumined, shining forth from the supernal sight abiding above him, whence he shines constantly. Uva ha shemesh. 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 Good. And, and the sun sets, coupling with the moon. Moving toward the south, the right depositing its potency there. Since its potency lies there, all the power of the body is on the right, dependent on the right. Then circling toward the north, illumining this side, illumining that side. Round and round whirls the wind. At first is written sun and now wind, but all is one, one mystery. All this so that the moon is illumined by him and the two of them unite. Okay, let's stop for a second. So Rabbi Yitzchak uh, is inspired by Rabbi Yehuda's discussion of the moon and the sun uniting with each other and brings up another verse, right? So he brings up a verse that is in Kohelet in Ecclesiastes, right? Which describes um, the, uh, 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 the circuit, right, of the sun doesn't quite uh, uh, jibe with uh, what we know, um, you know, of, that really happens. But this is this image that the sun, you know, goes out in the morning. Um, other places we have it like a chariot uh, uh, riding across the sky. This is the ancient image, right? And uh, um, it goes, V'zarach HaShemesh Uva HaShemesh. The Shemesh, the sun, shines forth. That's the that's the morning. It it comes out of its hiding place and, and begins to radiate. And then, uva hashemesh, and then the, uh, the sun sets. The word sets in Hebrew is arrives. It comes into its uh, home, into its dwelling place, right? When the sun sets, it means it goes back home. It goes into its shelter. 
And that's why we don't see the sun anymore, because the sun has gone inside. So that's the word ba, right? The word ba is to come, you know, to arrive. Um, and, the, and, and, and he pants, shoaif, toward where he rises, right? And even though the sun has now gone off into the west, it, it yearns to come back to the east. Right? It yearns to come back to the place where it will rise again. So that's the phrase in the, in the, in the in Kohelet. And in Kohelet, it's basically a, a, a statement of jaded, exhausted, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, if not cynicism, then uh, uh, just, you know, uh, ah, you know, this is the way it is. Everything is the same. It always happens like this. There's no difference between today and tomorrow, right? He's very tired, very, very world weary. But when Rabbi Yitzchak is reading this, he reads it with great excitement. He reads it with great uh, uh, joy. And he explains this is actually a statement about loving and about uh, uh, desire. So the sun shines forth. The sun is shining light on the moon. Right? So this, of course, is what we had before. This is the, the, the loving couple, the sun and the moon. And here we got it from the sun side. Before, Rabbi Yehuda was describing the yearning of the, of, the, of the moon. The moon has to turn and look toward her beloved with, with desire in order to be able to receive the life-giving light of her lover. Now we have, from the other perspective, the sun is so excited to be able to shine that love onto the moon. For when appearing with her, he glows, illumined, shining forth. So this is a, uh, a response to his beloved, where he himself is aroused by the desire of the beloved. And then where does the shining come from? From the supernal sight abiding above him, whence he shines constantly. So the sun here is at the core, at the center of the divine uh, torso, right? The sun is uh, uh, Tiferet. Where does the light actually come from? What's feeding the sun? Is the sun an independent source of light? So the answer is no. The light that, that shines forth from the sun is being fed to the sun from higher up where there's a constant shining. Constant shining as opposed to what? What's this opposition that the Zohar is, is putting forth between constant shining and what? Well, the sun sets, so it's not constant. Exactly, right. This is the sun is so magnificent, the sun is so wonderful, but the sun is a temporary wonder. Then the sun goes to sleep, the sun goes away. This is uh of course one of the midrashic uh, uh elements of the of the story of, of Abraham's quest for the true God. Right? He sees in the morning, he sees the sun and he goes, Oh, this must be God. Because look at how magnificent the sun is, and the sun shines over the whole world, and it's impossible to to uh, uh, avoid the sun, and 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 the plants and everything need the sun so badly. So the sun must be God, right? He's saying this to himself when he's approximately three years old, and then what does he see? The sun goes down, and he goes, "Oops, I guess that can't be God." God has to be eternal. God has to be continuous. God has to be all the time. And the sun is just a sometime thing. So the sun is not constant. So according to this hierarchy of imagery, the sun is participating in something that's bigger than the sun. The sun is participating in a source of light that never, never stops, that never sets that is completely continuous and eternal. That source of light comes from even higher up, right? From the, from the three uh, uh, forces of God that it's almost impossible to talk about, right? The upper three, right? The Gimel Rishonim, Rishonos. 
So, so that's the that's the uh, allusion here to that. The sun is, in that sense, a, a a diminution of God's great power. No matter how fully forceful the sun is celebrated to be, the sun does actually not encompass God's fullness. It's simply an an a a, a an indicator for us of something that's even beyond the sun. Okay, so uva Hashemesh, and then the sun sets. So I mentioned before the word ba means to arrive, to come in. So now the Zohar says, that's right. Back to the point we were making before. This is literal. This is the sun comes. The sun enters Shechina. This is the sexual union between the sun and the moon. That's we have it other places in the Torah, where the word ba means to have sexual intercourse with someone, that the man enters the the the, the woman. So here the Zohar says that's exactly what is being uh, said here. That first. The sun is full of passion. The sun is lit up. The sun is turned on, like we turn on a light. The sun is turned on by the beloved, the moon. And then the sun comes forth and, and embraces the, the, uh, the lover, the beloved, and unites with her, couples with her. And then the rest of the verse that continues after in the next verse in Kohelet, right? Moving toward the south. So this we've looked at before as well. North, south, east, and west is mapped out in the way the Zohar imagines the forces of God to be that the south is to the right and the north is to the left. Right? If you take a look again at the beginning diagram at the first, you know, at the beginning of the of the volume. Well, we have all of the spherot laid out. So the right side is north. The left side is uh, uh, the right side is south. The left side is north. That means the top is which direction? East, right? And then the bottom is west. So now, if we remember that, so we have moving toward the south. So the sun wants to go to the right side. The right side is the side of love. The right side is the side of generous giving, right? Of just completely pouring out that love. So the sun goes to the south, the right, depositing its potency there. So this we have again, a very literal uh, um, kind of uh, 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 image, a sexual image that this is where the potency of the sun is, is uh, put forward. Since its potency lies there, all the power of the body is on the right, dependent on the right. So this is the Zohar's explanation, and this is Rabbi Yitzchak's explanation. Why is the right side primary? Why is the right side the right side? The answer is the right side is that source of, of unstoppable love, because it is the, the result of the, the full force of, of, uh, of God's uh, life-giving energy, right? The, 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 uh, the culmination, um, the result of God's uh, um, pouring forth, literally um, emitting uh, the, the, the flow of, of life and love that God has that God desires to put forward. But then it keeps on going. Then there's the next step. Then circling toward the north, illumining this side, illumining that side. First to the south, and then to the north. The north side is the left. The north side is where Yitzchak is. The north side is that secondary side of receptivity, 
of holding on, of not letting things keep on flowing, of, of uh, stopping things up a little bit. But the light from the sun is flowing in that direction as well. Round and round whirls the wind. Someone wants to join the meeting. I hope you're uh, okay. Um, so round and round whirls the wind, the Ruach. So now the, the Zohar all of a sudden uh, asks, what's going on with the mixed metaphors? Right, As if the Zohar uh, doesn't mix metaphors all the time. But the Zohar says, notices that in Ecclesiastes, first we have sun imagery, and then we have um, uh, imagery of, of, of wind, uh, of ruach. Of course, ruach um, can also mean spirit. So the Zohar pushes aside this apparent uh, uh, difference and said, no, right? it's all together. It's all one uh, uh, thing, one mystery. The word mystery in, in the Zohar often uh, is a way of saying two things that don't look like they go together, they do go together. How? It's a mystery. But it's an affirmation that mystery is about putting things together that we wouldn't rationally think should go together. All of this so that the moon is illumined by him and the two of them unite. So what's the whole point of all of this uh, uh, moving around? What is this circuit of the sun all about? It's because, this, the, because the, the sun wants to uh, infuse uh, the moon with love, wants to take the moon in union and pour forth uh, its own love, its own life, its own light into um, its loving partner. I, the word ruach, of course, is associated with um, the the image of uh, of life itself. Right, um, the the spirit is not simply a, a uh, again a spiritual concept. It's a breathing concept. It's a it's a it's an air concept. <clears throat> when we have at the beginning of of, of creation, the ruach elokim merachefet al pnei we have that the whole world is chaos. There's darkness on the face of the deep. Choshech al pnei tohom, the ruach elokim merachefet al pnei and the wind, or the spirit or the breath of God was hovering over the deep. That breath is waiting to do something. It's waiting, it's hovering. Merachefet. And as it hovers, it finally, eventually, because it waits long enough, it finds a place to rest. Where does it rest? Where does that Ruach Elohim actually then find a home? Any guesses? It finds a home in the human being. It finds a home in the creation of Adam and Chava when they are a clump of clay, a clump of earth, and then God bends down and blows into their nostrils the, the, the uh, uh, breath of life. So the, the Ruach Elohim is waiting and waiting, merachefet, hovering, until finally, after six days, God finally sets up all that needs to be set up and then brings that Ruach and infuses it, infuses it into, into us, into us, gives us the life. So that desire, that waiting patiently, knowing that eventually it's all going to come together, that's part of the creation story. And here, the Zohar says, this is what happens day by day by day. The opposite of the, of the Kohelet idea. The opposite of the, of the tired uh, um, 
kvetchy, cramped quality of, of Kohelet. And instead, the Zohar says, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that every day God is aroused again and is full of love and wants to share that love and wants to infuse that love into the world and surrounds the love, north, south, east, west, surrounds the world with, with that love. That's, that's what's going on. Okay. And now the last paragraph of, of Rabbi Yitzchak. Come and see. Go ahead. Come and see. When Abraham came to the world, he embraced the moon, bringing her near. When Isaac arrived, he held her tight, fittingly, drawing her in love, as has been said, for it is written, his left hand beneath my head. When Jacob came, sun united with moon, illumined. Jacob became complete on all sides. The moon was illumined and arrayed with 12 tribes. Okay. So, um, any commentary from uh, anybody here about this last paragraph? This bringing together of, of uh, elements of our Torah story and of our, and our story uh, um, of our sages here? Come and see. What's 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 Rabbi Yitzchak uh, delineating? He's delineating stages, stages in this uh, uh, love story. First, it's just a cyclical picture of the sun circling around and finally embracing the moon. And now he says, in human terms. In, in the history of humanity, in the history of the Jewish people, there's also a kind of a circling around. And each patriarch plays a role in this love story. Each patriarch in some way plays a kind of a, of a partial son. Abraham is first circling toward the, sun, toward the moon, getting close to the moon, wanting, desiring, just like the sun first wants to come out and, 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 and shine on the moon. Then comes Yitzchak. Yitzchak takes the next step. Yitzchak is also the sun in a certain sense, S-O-N, uh, S-U-N, right? Um, but he, he goes his father one better precisely because he has that quality of being left-sided that Abraham didn't have, right? And, and that's a paradox, an interesting kind of paradox too. Abraham is, of course, is, is, is love, pure and simple. And yet, we've had this before, there's a certain quality that Isaac has, which we always see as secondary, as subsidiary to, uh, to Abraham. The left side is always secondary to the right side. And yet, it's because of the left side that the uh, uh, union eventually can happen. Without that left side, the arousal does not get consummated. So we've mentioned this many times. We don't have to go over it again and again and again. But there's something edgy that is required. Otherwise, the full-hearted love of Abraham doesn't quite consummate the deal, doesn't quite bring it all off completely. Um, but with that kind of darkness that Isaac brings, then the union is brought uh, fully together. And then the result of that union is Jacob. And Jacob then has 12 children, 12 sons that come out of his erratic activity and the proliferation, the spread of this divine uh, uh, love story um, becomes fuller and fuller and fuller. All right. And, and also, it's, it seems to me that um, at one time or another, each of the imaot are described uh, associated with Shechina and, right. and the moon. So it, um, the, the, uh, the Avot have their Sfirot and all the Imahot 
are piled into uh, right uh, you know. correct yeah very good all right that's it for tonight and Shabbat Shalom to everyone and Zaygezunt and I hope we'll meet again next week thank you Rabbi. thank you good Shabbos Shabbos, Shabbos. Shabbos.